Uh, welcome awesome. to Ethics of AI, day two. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it yesterday. Today, we're gradually transitioning from the shorter term to uh, longer term issues in thinking about the ethics of AI. Although I think, as you'll see, some of the issues that come up today are still relevant at both levels. Um, the session this morning is a mega session on artificial intelligence and human values, especially thinking about the way to which certain kinds of values um, and goals may want to affect the way that we design AI in order to have you know, outcomes that meet with human values. This has been a major uh, research program among both philosophers and AI researchers thinking about AI. I mean, the key idea is, I, is that as AI becomes increasingly powerful, then its impact on the world is going to be to some very significant part determined by what its goals are. And in order to make sure that that, that those goal that is that impact is one that aligns with our human values, maybe we ought to think about building in something like those values into an AI system. Now, this is a very rich subject. It raises all kinds of technical issues on the, uh, the AI research side. It raises all kinds of formal issues. It also raises some very rich philosophical issues for, um, you know, does this, does this whole approach embody certain substantive philosophical assumptions about the way in which, for example, value interacts with intelligence and rationality. So to this end, we've got this, uh, this session with five talks this morning approaching that issue from a number of different directions. Uh, the first two speakers are going to come, broadly speaking, from the, uh, from the area of AI research. The, uh, the third talk is going to bring in physics and psychology perspective for thinking about the issue of value. And the fourth and the fifth talks are, I guess you could see, as offering a kind of philosophical response and analysis to some of these issues. So we'll have five 20-minute talks, each followed by a 10-minute Q&A. Maybe we'll take a very brief moment to stretch our legs after the, uh, the third talk. And then the thought is, at the end, we may have, um, hopefully we'll have time for a substantial panel discussion among the group of the issues. But for, our, uh, for the first talk, it's a pleasure to have Stuart Russell here. Stuart, of course, is a major figure in uh, artificial intelligence, done all kinds of important work over the years, and he's the co-author of what's been the canonical textbook in the field for some years now. He's also been very much ahead of the curve in thinking about AI impact and the various ethical and social issues that arise. He's now um, setting up a major center at Berkeley for thinking about precisely these issues, and he's played a very big role, I think, in drawing the attention of AI researchers to these issues. Um, and his talk today is on provably beneficial AI. So please welcome Stuart Russell. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so I'll just get right into it. Um, I think we'll take this uh, as a given. I don't want to argue about this, although one can argue with it, that we will have AI systems that in the same sense that AlphaGo makes better decisions than we do on the Go board, that AI systems will make better decisions than we do uh, on the world board. And um, this is a good thing uh, because everything that we have, uh, that, we, that we hold valuable as part of our civilization, is the result of our intelligence. And so if we have access to a significantly larger source of intelligence, uh, if we use it wisely, uh, then it cannot help but be uh, a step change in civilization, or as some people have called it, uh, the biggest event in the history of the human race. Uh, and then the downside, um, I don't want to be alarmist or anything, but there's, there's a few downsides, uh, killer robots being one of them, uh, the end of employment being another, and the end of the world being the third. <laughs> in some order. Uh, so, okay, why, so I'm gonna talk about this third one. Why, why are people uh, worried about this? Well, if you just think about it, right, we're, we're gonna create things that are much smarter than we are. 
right? And th that just gives you a sense of unease. Uh, Turing uh, expressed that unease um, even before the field was named artificial intelligence. Uh, he said that, you know, in the, in the best case, they'll keep us as pets. Um, so this is not uh, a new concern. Um, and, uh, you know, if you ask these gorillas, you know, here they are having a meeting to discuss it, uh, you know, were, were your ancestors wise to create this, uh, this human race, uh, these, these uh, more intelligent beings? And us, I think by now they'd say, no, it wasn't, wasn't a good idea. Um, okay, so why specifically? Uh, I mean, we're not creating a new species, and these are, uh, these are things that we design, um, so perhaps it's a different situation. It's also perhaps different from a superior alien civilization landing on Earth. So those analogies are not exactly uh, persuasive. So what's really wrong? Um, so even though we will design these systems, the problem is that uh, they could be extremely good at achieving anything, and in particular, things that we don't want. Um, and there is no real uh, discipline that exists right now of figuring out what we want and making sure that that's what the machines are actually achieving. So all the fields that deal with rational decision making assume that the objective is exogenous, that someone else uh, is going to come along and plug it in, uh, and then the machinery, uh, whether it's the AI system or the you know, econometric optimization or whatever it might be, uh, the machinery is going to figure out how to achieve that objective and uh, maximize uh, that utility function. Uh, and this point was made by Norbert Wiener in a very nice paper uh, from 1960. Um, and I recommend reading that paper if you have the chance. Uh, so he says, if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Uh, and that sort of says it right there. Um, and you could say that this basic idea goes back uh, a lot further. So King Midas uh, put the purpose into the machine, so to speak, when he asked that everything turn into gold that he touches. Uh, and then it was too late. He realized that his food and his drink and his relatives were turning to gold. Uh, and he died of misery and starvation. Uh, and there was this problem of, of uh, a superior uh, agency carrying out the wishes that you state. Um, recently, Steve Omohundro, well, recently, 15 years or so ago, Steve Omohundro pointed out um, that there's even a, a, there's even a worse problem uh, or something that compounds that problem, that no matter what the objective you put in, uh, it's very hard for a machine to achieve that objective uh, if it's dead. And uh, therefore, the machine will attempt to preserve its own existence, uh, even if you don't put that in as an objective. And this has been uh, discussed extensively yesterday as well. Um, and it will also improve its chances of success by acquiring as much resources uh, as it can. Um, and so if you have those tendencies combined with an objective that is not quite the one that you want, then you're setting up a kind of a chess match or a go match uh, between the machine and the human race, and that doesn't necessarily go too well. And uh, so uh, this is the basis of the concern, or one of the bases for the concern. There are others, such as misuse, which I'm not going to address today, uh, but that's also a serious concern. Uh, so there's a number of arguments people have put forward why we shouldn't pay attention. In fact, there's so many that I can't go through even half of them. Uh, and uh, I could just, for those of you who, who have doubts that this is even worth studying, please come up with a more serious argument than the ones that people have come up with so far. Um, so I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, so you often see people within the AI research community having said all along that, you know, we're going to achieve super intelligent AI, as soon as you point out that might be a bad idea, oh, it's never going to actually happen, right? Whenever we're, going to, whenever we're not really going to produce super intelligent AI. Um, and I just like to tell a little story uh, about this gentleman, who's Lord Rutherford, who was the most famous nuclear physicist of his time. Uh, and on uh, September 11th, 1933, uh, he repeated something that he had been saying in many venues in many ways. Uh, that anyone who looks for a source of power in the transformation of the atoms is talking moonshine, right? Uh, and his position was that we would never be able to figure out how to extract the energy that they knew uh, was there in atoms because they already knew about mass defect and 
E equals mc squared. Uh, but even Einstein was convinced that it was basically impossible to get that energy out. Uh, and then on, uh, this is Leo Zillard, by the way, on September 12, 1933, uh, <laughs> he, he, figured out, uh, he figured out how to do it. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful when you say that something is never going to happen. Um, so, you know, some people say, well, it'll happen. It's so far off that we don't need to worry about it. Um, and you could say the same thing about, you know, the catastrophic effects of global warming. Uh, you know, they're, they're sort of off towards the end of the century. So let's not worry about it. Let's just keep on doing what we're doing. Um, and, you know, but if you, if you, for example, detected a large asteroid that was going to crash into the Earth in 50 years' time, you wouldn't say, oh, it's so far off, we don't need to worry about it, right? You'd say, well, it might take 50 years to figure out how to divert it or destroy it or whatever. So, so let's start thinking about it um, now. Uh, and just to add to that, this is not an accidental event. This is something that we, we the world, are driving towards, right? We are pushing, we are using tens of thousands of highly trained scientists, billions of dollars, to move in this direction. Uh, so it seems worthwhile to think about what happens when you get there. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over a lot of the rest of these arguments. Right, so one of my favorites is well-known AI people say, oh, you know, there's really nothing to worry about. We can just switch it off, right? As if a super intelligent machine couldn't think of that one. You know, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, so, so these, these arguments are symptomatic of a, of a denial syndrome uh, that is uh, worrying, actually, uh, because these are smart people and they're producing arguments that don't, that don't hold water for very long at all. Um, and probably one of the most insidious ones, actually, which uh, in, in the most recent uh, report from the AI100 study at Stanford, so this is a large body of distinguished AI researchers saying, well, you know, there might be risks, but don't mention them, because if you mention them, that might damage research on risk, <laughs> right? Uh, which is just completely bizarre. Um, and it's th it hasn't been a good strategy in the past. It didn't, it didn't do the nuclear industry much good to, to pretend that meltdowns couldn't happen and that nuclear waste did not need to be disposed of, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and, and essentially, the, the lack of honesty, and, and which caused, I think, a lack of uh, of internal uh, research and development and, and attention paid to risk uh, led to the effective demise of the entire nuclear industry. So there are no good examples of, of industries that succeed in the long run uh, by pretending that something that is real isn't real. Uh, so uh, as David mentioned, we just started a new center called uh, somewhat Rudely, perhaps, the Center for Human Compatible AI, as if the rest of the field isn't human compatible. Um, but it, it's, the title serves to just remind us that the whole point of AI is not to create intelligence for its own sake, although that's a really cool thing to work on, but actually to benefit the human race, and we ought to make sure that happens. And to do that, um, we have this goal of building uh, AI systems that are provably beneficial, and this is in some sense a deliberate oxymoron because beneficial is a very touchy-feely vague term and provably is sort of the opposite. So how do you put these things together? Um, so I have three, there's three principles uh, that have been helpful so far in our research. So the first one uh, I think we can all agree with is that the robot's objective is to maximize values for humans. And in particular, it has no objectives of its own. It has no self-preservation. It pays no attention to its own, you know, even its own monetary value because it's only the human that cares about the monetary value of the robot. Uh, and so you really care just about the, the maximization of human values. Uh, and the second principle is that the robot doesn't know what they are. This turns out to be very important. Uh, and then the third principle is that there is information about what those values are in the behavior of humans. Uh, in the, uh, what economists call the reveal preferences of, of human beings. Um, so uh, this term value alignment uh, is used in, in the general AI safety area. It means how do we get uh, the objectives of the robot lined up in the way that I just described with those of human beings. Uh, and so one technique that was actually invented for entirely other purposes uh, actually to try to understand the motor behavior of cockroaches uh, is called inverse reinforcement learning. 
And uh, it's the opposite of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, uh, you are given a reward signal, uh, and then you try to adapt your own behavior to, to get more of that reward, to optimize uh, your uh, long-term sum of rewards. And inverse reinforcement learning is the other way around. You're observing a behavior, and you're trying to figure out what is the reward function that this behavior is optimizing. So if the machine is observing the human and the choices that the human makes, that allows the machine to gradually understand uh, the value system uh, that the, the human's behavior is driven by. Uh, and it turns out, just in the same way that when I want to define a task for a machine, then defining the reward function is a very succinct uh, way of defining what the task is, uh, as opposed to, for example, describing all the action sequences that the machine should take under all circumstances, which is usually uh, not a very concise way of describing it. Uh, in the other direction, the, as an explanation of the behavior, the reward function can be a very concise explanation, uh, and hence very predictive. Uh, and so this can be a good way of learning, uh, of the robot learning how to behave well by first of all learning what the reward function should be. And this technique has been used to, to program uh, helicopters to do aerobatics uh, and, and various other kinds of tasks. Uh, it's, it's, it's being considered for use in self-driving cars um, so that the car drives in a style that, that you are comfortable with and so on. Um, so we actually need a slightly different version of this. So in inverse reinforcement learning, usually the robot is observing and learning this objective then adopts that objective uh, as its own. Uh, we don't quite want that uh, because if I'm drinking coffee, I don't want the robot to, to learn that it should drink coffee. Uh, that's not quite what we want. We want the robot to learn to make coffee for me uh, rather than want the coffee. Um, so we have a, a slightly uh, more complicated version called cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, which is, uh, the, in the simple form, a two-player game. So there's a human and a robot. Um, and so the human knows, in a sense, the value function in that the human can act according to it, but may not be able to explicate it in a form that could be directly programmed uh, into the robot. Uh, and we can allow for the human to be not perfectly rational. They, they can make mistakes and so on. Um, and then the robot doesn't know what this value function is, but its job uh, is to optimize it. And when you look at the solutions to this two-player game, uh, you find that they exhibit the properties that you would hope, that the robot now has an incentive to ask questions of the human uh, and to explore but do things cautiously because it doesn't want to do things that the human uh, would be unhappy with. And the human has an incentive uh, to teach the robot. Uh, and these fall out directly as solutions of this two-player game. We're not programming in teaching as a behavior. Uh, it just is an automatic consequence of the definition of the problem. Uh, and in fact, the human does not display the same optimal behavior that they would if the robot wasn't there. Uh, so in fact, that means that the inverse reinforcement learning formulation where the ro robot is assumed to be observing optimal behavior by a human is actually uh, an extreme special case where it's sort of looking through a two-way mirror uh, and the human doesn't even know they're being observed. But in general, the human will not behave optimally and will, for example, demonstrate if it's, a, let's say, a surgeon, right, will not just sew up the patient but will demonstrate carefully the steps of sewing up and maybe even give a commentary and so on. So, um, so the, the, the things you want to have happen uh, will happen in this, uh, in this scenario. So let me just give one simple uh, illustration uh, in the context of what's called the off-switch problem. So uh, as Steve Omhundra pointed out, if you have an objective uh, and the robot understands that it can't achieve that objective uh, if it's dead, so the, the catchphrase of this talk is you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Um, so in that circumstance, the robot uh, would seem to want to disable its own off switch, because if there's a possibility that uh, it might get switched off and therefore fail to get the coffee, uh, it seems like it's rational for the robot to disable the off switch so that that can't happen. Uh, and we don't like this idea, right? This is, this is precisely one, you know, the beginning of the, the robot apocalypse. Uh, and how can we avoid that? So uh, the answer is don't give the robot a, an objective really don't give the robot a precise objective. The robot should be uncertain about what the true human objective is. It might know that all things being equal, getting coffee is better than not getting coffee, but the all things being equal covers a lot of other attributes like 
uh, whether or not it's okay to assassinate uh, other people who are in line for coffee uh, in, case, in case they run out of coffee before you get to the front of the line. Um, is it okay to disable your off switch and so on? And the, uh, obviously, um, there can be uncertainty about the objective as a whole. And uh, the nice thing about that uncertainty is that the robot now reasons to itself, okay, well, I'm trying to make the human happy. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Uh, and my actions might be such that the human could, uh, could understand that I'm going about this the wrong way, uh, in which case the human will switch me off. But when you have uncertainty about the objective, that's a good thing, because the human is going to switch you off if, sw if switching off the robot is a better choice for the human. And since the robot cares about making a better choice for the human, then the robot in that situation would be happy to be switched off. It won't switch itself off because it doesn't believe that what it's doing is necessarily bad for the human, but it knows that the human knows better uh, and will switch it off if that provides an advantage to the human. So you can prove uh, that uh, under fairly general circumstances, if you set things up this way, it's in the robot's interest uh, to be... <laughs> Switched off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So this is um, right. This is a. Uh, th this I think is a fairly general point. I mean, the 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 theorems and and scenarios we defined so far are quite you know simple, specialized. Uh, pedagogical examples to illustrate the basic point. Um, but I think uncertainty in objectives is actually a much more important and general uh, issue that we've largely ignored. I mean, in, in AI, uh, we spent the first 30 years of the field saying there is no uncertainty, period, right? That will, you know, we have symbolic logical definitions, we have definite transition models, we have perfectly observable environments like chess, um, and uh, uh, and then sometime in the early 80s, but okay, there is uncertainty. Uh, you know, our sensors are not perfect, uh, and we don't exactly know what's going to happen. So, so there was a whole sort of revolution in AI. Uh, but even throughout that revolution, the idea that the objective itself was uncertain was completely ignored. It's just not even thought about, uh, and which is bizarre, really. Um, and there is actually a technical reason why you might have ignored it, but I don't think this was the reason why it was ignored which is that in a standard decision problem like a Markov decision process, uncertainty in the objective is actually completely irrelevant because you can just integrate over it and you behave exactly uh, like the agent that has the definite objective, which is the expectation of your uncertain objective. Um, so, what's the, what, so what's the difference? Okay, there's more than one minute, sorry. So what's the difference? Uh, the difference is that in reality, the environment can provide more information about the objective. If it doesn't, then it really doesn't matter. The uncertainty can be integrated out. Uh, but if it does, then it really does matter. And you get very different behaviors than you can get from any agent that has a definite objective. Um, and so observable human actions are a source of information uh, about what the, what the true objective is. You might also say, well, what about reward signals? What about the standard reinforcement learning setting where a reward signal is provided? And that could provide more information uh, about uh, the objective. Well, I actually think that this, this is an incorrect mathematical framework. I've come to this conclusion reluctantly because I think reinforcement learning is great, but uh, I don't think the reward signal is a reward. I think the reward signal should be viewed as information about what the true reward is. Okay, and if you think about it, right, if your objective is to maximize human values, then uh, your, your reward is, in some sense, is in heaven, right? That the, that the human is happy with what's going on. Uh, and the human can't give you a reward, right? All it can do is tell you that, it's the, hum that the human is uh, possibly happy uh, with what's going on. And if you formulate it this way, if the reward signal is just information and not a natural reward, then the wireheading problem, which is the problem that a reward-seeking agent will take over the mechanism that provides rewards and then feed itself uh, as much reward as it can possibly generate, 
that problem goes away because if you take over the human who is providing the reward signal uh, and force them to give you rewards, you're not actually gaining any information whatsoever about uh, what the true human reward function is. And so, uh, in fact, it's deleterious to your uh, objective, which is to make the human uh, actually happy, right, rather than make the human supply you with reward signals. Um, and so this, this perspective, I think, maybe resolves some of the concerns that people have had uh, about wireheading and, and those uh, negative consequences of reinforcement learning setups. So what we're trying to get then is a theorem like this, right? That uh, as long as the human can be viewed as even slightly better than random uh, in choosing their actions to, to uh, optimize their own objectives, then a robot observing that human will be uh, a net benefit uh, compared to not existing. Uh, and we can show this theorem in these simple settings uh, and we hope to be able to generalize this to more, more interesting things. Um, so, uh, very quickly, um, if we take this seriously, right, we get outside of toy worlds and we say, all right, let's think about 20, 30 years where we really do want to figure out the human value function so that by the time we have powerful AI systems, uh, they can actually understand what we want and do things right without every, everything having to be spelled out in enormous detail, uh, there's a massive amount of evidence about human behavior. Pretty much everything we've ever written is about people doing things and other people being upset about it. Uh, and so all of this provides, uh, provides evidence for what our value function is. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, another good thing is that we will have to solve this problem not in the long term, but actually in the short term. If you have a, uh, a personal digital assistant, which is now a, a very rapidly growing uh, sector of the industry, you don't want your assistant and, uh, let's say, Donald Trump's assistant to have the same objectives, right? That wouldn't work very well at all. Uh, and so your assistant has actually got to learn your preferences uh, very quickly uh, and book you into the right kind of hotels and uh, put you on the right flights and refuse emails from the right people and so on and so forth. Um, so we have to solve this problem uh, pretty quickly. There's a very strong economic incentive, which I think explains in part uh, the emergence of this partnership for AI. Um, so just to give you another example, right? if, if the robot is uh, in the house and has to feed the kids because uh, you are late home from work and there's nothing in the fridge and the robot sees the cat, uh, <laughs> then you could have, you could have a problem. Right? And uh, that only has to happen once for the, for the domestic robot industry to be you know, wiped out for a decade. So there's this really strong incentive to get this problem right, to understand the nutritional value versus sentimental value uh, trade-off. Um, unfortunately, right, here's the big problem, and I'm sure all of you social scientists know this already, that, that people are much more complicated than you know, just straightforward, uniform, uh, utility optimizers. Uh, there are a lot of nasty people. Uh, we have very strong constraints on our computational architecture and capabilities, uh, and we vary enormously, uh, or possibly enormously, in, in our various preferences. Uh, and it's not even clear that even if we, even if we allow for the computational limitations of humans, uh, that I if we knew what those were, uh, would it still be the case that we could model a human as having a value system, but optimizing it in this very limited and inaccurate way. It's not even clear that that's true. Um, but that's the working hypothesis uh, for the time being. Um, and uh, the other question, oh, I got these in the wrong way. So the other, so the other question is then, you know, how, how do we not learn from Hitler's behavior? Uh, and this is a complicated thing, right? Obviously, if everyone behaved like Hitler, then all those Hitlers would be very unhappy, right? Because none of them would have world domination. Uh, and uh, they, this, this, this would be a very unsuccessful group of, uh, of humans. So there's a sort of lack of self-consistency in certain types of value functions that prefer domination of other people and uh, are not happy when other people are happy and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't want to be in the business of dictating what the world value function should be, uh, but we would like some way of, of doing better than just taking a sort of population average. Um, okay. So there's a lot of questions, and uh, David will probably say, why don't we have the audience ask those questions? So fine, I'll just give you some prompts. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 
so this is, a, this is a big change, I think, in the way AI thinks about its goal, which has been, let's build intelligence, and then we'll plug in objectives and hope for the best. Uh, instead, let's build systems that are provably beneficial for us, right? not, not for ants or aliens, but for us. Um, uh, there's interesting questions about well, where do human values come from in the first place? I used to think that it was sort of, you know, all sort of derivative from the bi basic biological drives, uh, but actually I think it's much more cultural and passed on by sort of built-in inverse, reinforce, in, reinverse, inverse reinforcement learning process uh, that, that we come with, uh, and we adopt the values that we use to explain the behavior of others around us. Um, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> okay. We've got time. Two minutes for questions. We've got time for one or two questions. Ned and Eliezer, why don't you come up here and um, get set up? Yeah, that's on. Uh, so how do you keep the robots from manipulating the human values? That would be a much better way of making sure the robot knows what those values are to make them be a certain way. Also, you could produce values that are easier to satisfy. Uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's true. We could, the robot could do brain surgery and change the values. But in the, in the model, we have actually the the human values are assumed to be fixed, so that wouldn't actually work. But they're not fixed. Right. They're, I, I, agree, I agree with that as a, as a general point, but we, yeah, one, one step at a time. So you say that um, these AIs would observe humans in order to determine what the value function is. But you answer your question about how we prevent the off switch problem by having the AIs assume that. My question is, how will AIs account for human mistakes while also maintaining that a human turning it off is, the best is in the best interest for human values? So the robot could assume that the human is making a mistake when it tries to turn off the robot. Yeah, so it, the, model we, the model that's in the paper uh, allows for the human to, to behave suboptimally, right? And there's a, there's a standard, Boltz, called the Boltzmann model, where the human picks an action, but with certain probability picks something suboptimal, and the probability of picking it uh, drops off exponentially with how bad it is. Um, and you know, so in that model, you can show that the, the larger the irrationality of the human, the, the more of a buffer you need in the form of uncertainty about what the, what the utility function is. Um, and if, but if your buffer is large enough, then there's still a positive incentive to allow yourself to be switched off. If the human is deliberately anti-rational, right, so the, on, on average, the human works against their own best interest, uh, then that really is a problem, right? Because then you, it doesn't make any sense to assume that the human is going to switch you off in order to benefit the human. Because in fact, that, this human will switch you off in order to hurt themselves. Uh, and what do you do with a human who wants, uh, who acts, sorry, not wants to hurt them, but who acts to hurt themselves uh, even though they don't want to? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Stuart, we desperately need your assistance down here to set up your laptop for Eliezer. In the meantime, I'll give a leisurely introduction for... Uh...